Hey, this is Samuel Peralta. And this is Justin Sloan. This is Sarah Nofke. This is M.A. Phipps, and you're listening to 30, 30, 30, 30 Minute Author Interviews with Preston Lay. Woo! Hey guys, before we jump into this week's episode, I want to tell you about two different sponsors that we have. First up is Serial Box. Serial Box delivers exciting episodes of ongoing stories straight to your device every Wednesday. They bring everything that's awesome about TV to what's already cool about books with addicting serials you can take with you on the go. All of their episodes are available in text and audio, and their sleek app makes reading easier than ever. They have a range of titles from gritty urban thrillers to sexy sword fighting fantasies and everything in between. Season 2 of The Witch Who Came In From The Cold just started up. The Witch Who Came In From The Cold. All the subterfuge of the Americans with a dark dose of magic. Head on over to SerialBox.com where you can read and listen to it now. And of course, the first episode of Season 1 is free so you can check it out there. SerialBox.com S-E-R-I-A-L-B-O-X.com Our second sponsor this week is the Galactic Satori Chronicles, written by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. A thirst for revenge sends one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in this adrenaline-pumping new series. Asher is a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiancée's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. In a desire to better understand humans in order to destroy them, these aliens are projecting their consciousness into unsuspecting men and women, and in the process are learning exactly how to use humanity's own selfishness and greed as weapons against them. Fueled by emotions that the aliens will never understand, Asher bands together with a group of friends. These four MIT co-eds are more than meets the eye and go to battle with those who are intent on destroying our planet. Asher takes the fight from Earth to an alien spaceship and then to the very planet of the enemy trying to destroy them. Galactic Satori Chronicles can be found on Amazon. Book 1, Earth, is available for 99 cents, and you can pre-order Book 2, Cron, for 99 cents as well. If you'd like to learn more about either one of our sponsors, head on over to Legendarium.com and check out the show notes. We'll have links to both of our sponsors so you can check them out. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. Our guest today is Chris Kennedy. Thank you for taking time and coming on our podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Preston. It's great to be here. Yeah, not a problem. Well, we have started off our podcast here uh, with a segment called Two Truths and a Lie, where you tell me two truths and a lie about you, and I am not too great at this yet. Um I try to guess which one is the lie. So if you could, do you have two truths and a lie about yourself? I do. Um, And, you know, uh, I know that uh, you haven't always lived in in some of the best places. So I'm going to start out with uh, I've had three people try to kill me. Wow. (laughs) Um, The uh, let's see. Second one, uh, the police wouldn't let my wife vote in the last election. And third, of the uh, 14 books that I've written, five of them have been number one bestsellers in their category on Amazon. Wow. So all of those sound like they could have happened or (laughs) – man, I have a feeling I'm not going to get this one right. Um, Let's see. I don't know much about your military history, but I know you do have a military history. So the three people trying to kill you is probably pretty realistic. Uh, And I know that some of your books have been – have they been bestsellers or just sell really good? Man, I'm going to say the law is the one about your wife not being able to vote in the last election. 
All right. Well, my wife is Canadian, so uh, oh. she could not vote in the last uh, election. <laughs> and that's why I, I didn't mention where she was from that's as we right. were uh, preparing. <laughs> uh, that's that's why I have 12 hour drives to go visit the grandparents. There we go. <laughs> um, I have had three people try to kill me. That that was during the Kosovo War and in some other flights that I was on in the military. So you were dead on about that. OK, that was that was absolutely absolutely true um, of the 14 books I've written. And only two have been number one bestsellers. Okay. Uh, I've had I've had um, probably almost all of them were were in the top ten. Um, but you know it's like having a number one uh, hit on the radio. You know a lot of times it's a matter of timing, and you know you get there and oh Andy Weir has just come out with another book. You know he's he's going to be at the top and he's going to be hard to displace. Right. Uh, so you know it's it's a matter of timing as much as anything else and. Uh, Two of them, number one bestsellers, uh, most of them in the top ten. Okay. Well, that is interesting. Well, for those that uh, might not know who you are and what you do, can you give our little uh, give our listeners a little bio on who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, Chris Kennedy. I'm a former naval aviator, as we already discussed. Uh, also have been an elementary school principal. Uh, now science fiction, fantasy author, uh, publisher as well. Uh, I've got, uh, like I said, 14 books out on my own um, and have published one, two, three, four, five um, by the by the end of next month, I think I'll have published 10 other people. So wow. uh, I've become a small press in my own right, uh, as well as uh, an author, um, and really, really love doing it. So how do, how did you transition from being in the Navy to being a elementary school principal? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it it is a very different environment, obviously. Uh, it was the and the one thing that I had to learn um, was going from a, an all male, well, not all male, but male centric uh, organization to a very female centric organization. Um, I, I had to learn to speak differently. Uh, for example, when it came time for evaluations, you know, in the military, you say, OK, hey, you're doing this great. You know, keep doing this. Keep doing that. Uh, I need you to work on this. Um, you know, go to do an evaluation in a school and uh, first teacher comes in and, and I said, hey, you know, you're you're really doing wonderful. I, I like what you're doing here. You know, you do this well, um, you know, something to work on next year is is this one thing. And she goes out and, and about five seconds later, my secretary comes running in and goes, oh, my God, what did you say to her? <laughs> and I said, I said, I told her she did a good job. She's she left in tears. And and so <laughs> I realized very quickly that that I was going to have to learn uh, to say things in different ways. Right. Um, so uh, aside from that, though, it, it was really good. Uh, I got my I got a doctorate while I was still in the uh, in the Navy. So I had a doctorate in educational leadership, which made the transition uh, easy. Um, you know, being a principal at an elementary school is like having a, a squadron of 300 people. Um, you know, it's it's leadership and, and you can't do everything yourself. You need to learn to delegate and uh, train the people that are underneath you to do their jobs well and um, and then, you know, give them all of the resources they need to do it. And that's leadership. Be, yeah. That, and that can be one of the hardest things, too, is learning to let other people help you. I remember when I was in Boy Scouts going for my Eagle Project, uh, the point of the Eagle pro one of the points of the Eagle Project is you can't do all the work. You have to assign people to do stuff. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. was the hardest thing in the world for me to say, okay, well you go do that or you go do this. Cause I felt like I could do it all. You know, uh -huh. I need to get, and, and sometimes people let you down yeah. when you trust them with stuff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I remember that was the, man, that was the hardest thing about the project was just letting people do stuff. Cause I, you know, we need to get some donations Well, I can go pop by some businesses. It's no problem, but you can't, you, you have to let, other people do the work. So, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, so how did you first get into writing? 
Well, um, I've I've heard said that 81 percent of people have a story they want to tell. Uh, I was always part of the 19 percent. Uh, I never I never had a story, never particular, never particularly wanted to be a writer. I loved reading. Um, I, I think I read every uh, every book in the children's section of the High Point, North Carolina Public Library growing up. Uh, anytime they had new sci fi, they'd call my mom. So, you know, because they knew we'd come right over. Right. Um, but. I, I never had wanted to be a writer. And one day I was I was driving home from work and some of the things I had seen kind of gelled in my head. And I said, well, you know, if this, then that, then this, then that, then this, then that. Oh, hey, wow. Hey, look at that. China just invaded Seattle. How about that? <laughs> um, and, and I said, wow, that'd, that'd be a neat story. And I said, well, what would I do with it? I, I don't know an, an agent. I don't know anybody in publishing. What what would I do with it? And I said, well, but it's it's a cool story. It's It's really neat. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, what would I do with it? And, you know, the, the rest of the way home, I, I basically talked myself out of it. Um, and I get home and I walked in and my wife said, oh, you know, dinner's going to be a little late because life. And I said, oh, OK. And I thought to myself, well, gee, maybe I'll sit down and write a little and see where this goes. Um, so I pulled out the laptop and sat down at the kitchen table and started typing. And, and she said, uh, what are you doing? And I said, uh, I'm writing a book. And she went, no, no, really. What are you doing? Because <laughs> because it was so outside, you know, anything that I'd ever done. And, and I said, no, I'm serious. I'm I'm writing a book. And and she said, wasn't funny the first time. And I was like, no. And, and you know, flash forward, um, you know, eight months, and and I I approached her and I uh, had this this check, um, and I said, hey, look. Uh, I'm paying off um, first semester of my son's college uh, with this check. And she's like, oh, my God, where'd that come from? I said, oh, I just got paid uh, for the royalties from uh, the book. And she said, what are you doing? I said, <laughs> what do you mean? She says, you should be writing. Get over at the table and start writing right now. <laughs> so, wow. So, yeah, kind of kind of came full circle there. So so you had pretty good success then with with the first thing you put out. Uh, I did it. It sold uh, about 5,000 copies, which, you know, isn't, isn't ginormous. Um, you know, it's not going to break any records, but, um, you know, for a first time indie author who's never done it before and, uh, kept, um, the, the prices or, you know, kept the costs way down, um, you know, that, that turns into a decent amount of money. Um, you know, 5,000 at, you know, if you're doing it as an indie and it's three ninety nine, you're getting, uh, you know, two eighty, two seventy a book. So you know, you're talking, you know, thirteen thousand dollars. Yeah. You know, that's you know, that's enough to pay for a, a semester of college. Um, so which which book series uh, or which which book was that that you first? That was uh, Red published? Tide. Okay. Red Tide, the the Chinese invasion of Seattle. Okay. So do do you remember where the inspiration for that book came from? Was it was just yeah, driving all absolutely. Day? Um I uh <laughs> I when when we had just moved back from um Pennsylvania to Virginia Beach and it was right during sequestration and uh, all the all the um companies were cutting back, the government was cutting back. Um I went I went jobless for nine months. You know, I was filling out 25 applications a day, busting my butt, couldn't get hired. Um, I finally got picked up, um, but I was working for the Navy and I needed a clearance and I didn't have a clearance yet. Um, so I, I had to go into work or I wouldn't get paid, but then I couldn't do much while I was there because I, I wasn't allowed access to a lot of the stuff. Um, so I was flipping through, um, you know, CNN or Fox news or something. And I saw a thing on the Detroit auto show. And one of the things was that China had brought over one of their new cars. And, uh, the, the interview with, uh, the Chinese rep was, you know, Hey, if, if this car sells, then we're going to come and, and make a uh, a plant here and, and we'll build them in the United States. And I thought, wow, if if they bring over, you know, the technology and they, you know, they they have a plant here in the United States. And the guy said, well, it'll probably be Portland or Seattle. I said if they were to do that in Seattle, they would probably have so many spies in that building 
you know, from the, the Chinese government and, and OK, well, if they had spies and and then they did this and then if this other thing happened and they could get all these people into Seattle. And oh, by the way, Seattle's where the uh, U.S. Navy keeps all of its nuclear weapons for the West Coast. So if they grabbed a couple of those and then said, hey, uh, Mr. President, uh, we've got your own nuke. And if you attack us, uh, it's going to go off and you're going to nuke yourself with your own nuke, um, what would we do? And, you know, the, there's no reason why they would necessarily do that because um, they, don't, they don't necessarily want Seattle. However, they do want Taiwan. And if they could use that as a distraction so that they could take Taiwan, say uh, Taiwan starts, you know, getting a, a nationalist urge and they say that they're going to uh, become independent, they they're gonna they're gonna want to try and do something to Taiwan, but we've always said that we'd defend it, and that would be a way to keep us out of the out of the war in the Pacific. You know, tie us tie us there. You know, in the in the states. Um, and I was like, wow, ooh, that'd be bad. Right. Then what would we do? I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to sit down and figure that out. What what would happen? Um, and how would that work? Um, and, and it was it was a neat process, you know, going through it all as a as a first time author. And, you know, I, I was um, I, I'm not a plotter. Uh, even to this day, I don't I don't plot. Uh, I'm more of a, a seat of the pants. You know, I'm a pantser. Um, and, and so a lot of the, the fun of writing stories is uh, finding out what happens um, and, and how it happens. Uh, there's been a couple times where I've I've been writing and and all of a sudden somebody that I thought was a good guy is revealed to be a bad guy and I'm like oh my god how did that happen <laughs> I liked him gosh man you know and 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 no one was more surprised than I was uh, so so that's that's been that's been fun um, and you know I the the hardest thing I ever did, you know, once I, I got the book done and, and I, I studied everything I needed to do for for self-publishing. And uh, well, I people ask, how did you become a self-publisher? Well, 75 agents said no. Right. Um, <laughs> so that that kind of turned me into a self-publisher. Um, and, and, you know, so I knew I needed it edited. I got it edited. I uh, needed a book cover, got a book cover, um, you know, and, and now I've got it uploaded onto Kindle. And the hardest thing I, I think I've ever done was push the publish button because everybody was going to know what a fraud I was because I don't have a literary background. I, you know, my, my major in college was chemistry, um, you know, and chemists generally aren't known for being excellent writers. Um, and it just, oh gosh, it was so hard. I, I, I sat there, you know, the, everyone had left the house to go do errands and such. And, and I had the cursor on the publish button and, and I just couldn't force my finger down to, to click the mouse. And, and I finally, you know, I, I got to the point where I, I just went bam and hit it. And then I jumped off and ran, jumped out of the seat and ran across the kitchen in case the uh, computer blew up. <laughs> Um, but it didn't. And, and I went back over and I, I refreshed it and, and went to the, the sales screen and I'd already sold a book. And I went, oh, my God, I'm a professional author. Right. You know, and it was like, how did that happen? Um, and and then, you know, funny thing happened. People bought it and bought it more. And I was like, wow, I guess I better write the uh, write the second one. And uh, that sold well. And uh, then uh, I, I've always been a science fiction fan myself, and I, I didn't want to write sci-fi at the start because I wasn't really sure I could. Uh, I needed to, you know, kind of learn a little bit. Um, but but after the, the first two books, I, I took the characters and took them to space, uh, and it became sci-fi. And um, then, then sales really exploded, and uh, haven't looked back. Wow, that's that's incredible. Um Man, so many different directions. I think, I think that was the, the, the 10 minute answer, I promise you. <laughs> we're we're going to keep it short. Okay. That's right. <laughs> Three questions and we'll be done. Yeah, well, maybe not so much. <laughs> um, so, since you had you know, some fairly good success with your first book, were there any lessons that you learned while writing your, uh, your first book that um, have helped you through your writing career uh, to this point? Um, yeah, uh, I I learned tons. I mean, because I started out with with you know zero knowledge. Um, the the one thing that that I learned the most 
um, which which I've seen with with every first time author is no matter how many times you read that, you know, your first book is probably crap. Um, you know, everyone thinks, oh, it's 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 not crap. I'm the one person that didn't write a, a crappy first book. Um, I went back and looked at it a couple years later and, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is barely readable. Um, you know, just because with each book, you know, you get better and, and, and I study and, you know, read about writing and read about marketing. And um, I looked back at it, you know, like a, a year and a half, two years later, and, and I almost couldn't read it um, and, and had to go back and, and revise it and put out a second edition. I'm like I'm, I'm a much better writer now. Don't read this and think that that's me. <laughs> right. um, you know, but but everybody's like, you know, they put out their first book and and oh, it's perfect. And and when I put it out, you know, I was like, oh my god, this is such a great book and and it's wonderful and it's awesome. And and then I look at it a little later and I'm like, yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> right. Um, and so now a lot of the stories you write are are military science fiction. Um, which which one of your military science fictions is your your best-selling military sci-fi series? Um, well, most of the books are in uh, the same series, so you know that would be that would be that one. Um, Jana series is uh, has sold more than any other book, and and that's uh, right at about twenty thousand copies. Okay. Um, the uh, the one that I currently have out now. Uh, is called Asbaran Solutions. It is a um, it is a project that I'm working with another author on, uh, Mark Wandry. He and I have a universe. Uh, it happens. The universe is uh, about a hundred years after first contact with the Galactic Union, um, and and the only thing that the Earth has of any value to the Union is um, mercenaries, people that are willing to go and uh, fight and die for money. Uh, because most of the other um, races in the the universe won't. There's only 36 uh, races that'll that'll fight. Um, most are you know peaceful, but it, it's kind of a very libertarian universe where there isn't much of a police force. And if you want something done, you you go pay mercenaries and they do it for you. Um, and and uh, humans became the 37th race, and uh, we went out to the stars, and you know, pretty much got creamed uh, once we got out there because you know our, our machine guns are going up against uh, laser rifles and uh, you know um, mass accelerators and all sorts of stuff. Um, so over time, we we developed the uh, tools and technology to, to let us hold our own. And we're now uh, able to, you know, be effective. Um, and, and so this happens about 100 years after first contact. Um, and he and I are writing a series that are the four horsemen. Um, out of the first 100 companies that went out to the stars, only four came back. Uh, they ha- all happened to have a horse in their logos. Uh, so they became known as the Four Horsemen, um, and they got they got a big start on all of the rest of the mercenary firms because they were the first ones to come back with all of this galactic credits um, and actually be able to buy stuff. Um, and in that book is out right now. Uh, Mark Wandry had the first book out. Uh, his is currently up to uh, it's been as high as number eight. Um, in a whole bunch of categories on Amazon. Uh, mine uh, came out about a month after it, so it's still on its way up. It's at about 23 right now. Okay. Um, and is getting uh, something silly like 30,000 page reads a day oh, you know, wow. in Kindle Unlimited. Wow. Um, you had said earlier uh, in The Two Truths and a Lie that you had two books go to number one bestsellers. Which, which one of your books were number one bestsellers? Red Tide actually was. Okay. Um, it was. Uh, I did uh, a free weekend on it, um, and I, I advertised it a bunch, and it went all the way to number one in military. Um, and and actually, uh, it got downloaded seventy five hundred times uh, that weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it not only was number one in military, but it went all the way up to number two in all of science fiction. Oh wow. Yeah, which is a, a monstrous category. Yeah. Uh, so, so that was that was very cool. Uh, the other one, number one book I have uh, was my book on self publishing, um, which uh, it came out and uh, just so happened that there was uh, an article that came out on me 
in uh, the local Virginia Beach uh, paper. Um, and, and the paper goes to all of Hampton Roads, Virginia, you know, Norfolk, Virginia Beach and, and around. Um, had a really nice picture of me on the cover. And uh, all of all of the people in the area that I guess ever wanted to publish um, ran out that weekend and bought it and drove it up to number one. <laughs> That's interesting. So it's it's amazing the the power of the press still to this day, even though you think, oh, Internet, social media, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the, there's still, uh, you know, some power in the press if if you can uh, get into it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I wanted to ask you what, why I had you on here about one of your uh book series just uh from looking at the covers it's going to be and i'm probably going to say it wrong so you're going to have to correct me it's is it codex uh, regius yeah regis? oh absolutely yep okay codex regius yep. codex regius um each book looks like it has a metal on the front of the book cover uh, uh-huh. are those metals did you base those on any real military awards or anything or did you uh, have somebody create those well, they're they're actually medals that are given in the books, um, so they're they're kind of discussed a little bit in the book. Um, and and the funny part of that is, uh, I told my cover designer, "Hey, you know, uh, here's what I want. I, I want this military medal. I I need it to be kind of a little like this, and and have this emblem on it, and and you know, whatever you can do with that." Um, and and my cover designer is not military, right. um, so she went and found a, a medal. And, and designed the first one. And we went through a couple different um, rounds of, dear God, that looks nothing like any military medal I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. Um, and, and I should know, I've got like 20 of them. Oh, wow. Um, but, you know, and, and she, she, I really liked the ribbon that she did. And I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll keep the ribbon, but we need something a little better and like this. And, and uh, she got it. And, and then, you know, she, um, from there went on and got the second one and the third one, you know, really well without, you know, as much micromanaging on my part. Right. Um, the, the neat thing about those covers also, uh, if you put them together, they make one solid picture. Oh, really? same thing with, uh, the, the earlier series, Janissaries, when the gods aren't gods and, uh, Terra stands alone. Uh, both of those series, uh, was one single picture cut up into thirds uh, so if you put the books together on a table, they'll they'll make a picture. Oh, that's that is awesome. Now I definitely want to get them so I can so I can do it. <laughs> yep, that's cool. Um, so f- for those that might not know what that series is about, can you kind of give a non spoiler blurb on what that series is about? Sure. Uh, author Chuck Gannon called them um, Star Wars meets John Ringo. Okay. Uh, so anybody that that you know reads military science fiction will know John Ringo, um, kind of a, a very gritty you know frontline kind of kind of guy, kind of look at war. Um, basically, uh, aliens come and and say, hey, we need uh, we just saw what you did in in occupied Seattle. Uh, we need to get back to our planet. We've got a ship. Uh, but, you know, we we need your help. Uh, oh, by the way, there's a, a race of evil aliens coming. You may want to do something about that because they're going to destroy the Earth. Um, you know, and so the the first series, uh, Janissaries, When the Gods Aren't Gods and Terra Stands Alone, uh, are is the Theogony, uh, which is uh, a book that was, I think, originally written in like 1600 B.C. Uh, the Theogony is the nature and origin of the gods and, and basically. Basically, as as you know, the the group goes out to the stars. They learn that everything they thought they knew about history, they didn't know about history. Um, you know, the the things that have gone on in Earth's history are a lot of times based on things going on out in out in the stars and aliens coming and and doing things and micromanaging us. And uh, so we find out that that a lot of the creatures that you know are mythological, we think, uh, actually exist. Um, and, and they run into them. Um, you know, some of the people, uh, are, are the same. So, uh, that series really gets into kind of the Greek mythology. Um, and there's a short story that, that went along with us. That was the death of Atlantis that, uh, tells you where the, uh, the, the Greek gods came from. Okay. Um, the second series, the Codex Regius, um, I finished the, the first trilogy and thought I was done. And all of the readers said, no, no, you must write more. Uh, it must be a trilogy of trilogies like, 
like Star Wars, only better. <laughs> um, so so I, I started on the, the second trilogy and, and I went after uh, Norse mythology in that, which is the uh, Codex Regius is the, the guiding document on uh, Norse mythology. And you'll find the Aesir and the Jotun, um, you know, Thor and Odin and all of those kind of guys um, out in the stars. Uh, it's it's not exactly as what Marvel or, you know, any of the, the superhero movies would tell you, um, because, you know, it's stories that we learned 4,000, 6,000 years ago. And, you know, that's kind of adapted and shifted over time. So it's it's close, but always not always, you know, the same as what uh, you would think reading a, a cu- current comic book. OK, so so to read the codex, they need to read first read the uh, you said it was the Theogony series. Yeah, um, you can. You, you certainly can. Uh, you don't have to. The, the trilogy is standalone and, and there's enough, uh, you know, kind of a, a what has gone before sort of thing. Okay. Um, each of the books I, I tried to write as a standalone book where, you know, you can read the story and get a story out of it. You know, you don't you're not left in the middle and go, oh, well, how does it end? And he cheated me. He didn't give me a story. Um, you know, they're, they're all stories in their own right. Certainly uh, the trilogies read better if you do them in order. Um, but but you don't have to read, you know, the, the theogony to, to start with uh, the search for Graham, which is the first Codex Regis book. OK, so with that theogony series, did you do the same thing with the covers where if you put them side by side, it creates one big image? Sure did. <laughs> that's, that's so awesome. That is yep. so cool. I love that. that and the genesis of that was uh, the cover designer and I were sitting in Panera in Virginia Beach, and we were trying to decide. He had done the first two, the uh, Red Tide and Occupied Seattle, and we were trying to decide what we wanted to do for you know the next series. And uh, we, I had tossed something out, and he was like, eh. And, and he tossed something out and I went, yeah. And, and, you know, we were sitting there and he says, you know, it'd be cool. And I said, no, what? He said, if we, if we took, you know, like one picture and cut it into thirds where we could, you know, have, have one third on each of the books and we could squish them all together and then, you know, make the full picture. I was like, yeah, that'd be <laughs> awesome. Um, so the the first three just have the uh, the front cover have the picture, um, but when you get to the Codex Regis, it wraps all the way around, uh, so you can you know lets you do a little more with it. So that's oh, that is awesome. That is so yeah. cool. You know, it, it's one of those things. It was a is a, a process of learning. You know, the first covers, um, you know, were not as great as I wanted. The second ones were better, um, but then by the third go round, I was getting you know full wrap covers that where the image goes all the way around the book, and it looks a lot more professional. And you know, makes me makes me look like I know what I'm doing. Right. How about that? <laughs> Um, I heard on another interview that you did another podcast you were on, um, you meant they, they brought up how you will put some of your fans in, in your book as what you call red shirts in your books. Um, Absolutely. Do you still do that? And, uh, um, I do. Where did that idea come from? And then where can your fans go if they would like for you, like to be put in one of your stories? Um, the idea originated with Star Trek. Um, you know, the guys that, that wear the red shirts are the ones that go down to the planet and die. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and somebody had, had started doing that. Uh, there's, um, the term is Tuckerization. I think Tucker either started it or was the first. I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I, yeah, I let people be red shirts. Um, you know, if, if they go to the website, which is Chris Kennedy publishing.com, um, there's a, a page that is, you know, join the red shirts. Um, and it tells you what you need to do to, become a red shirt. Um, and I, I still, you know, I still put people in, um, the last book I did, um, as brand solutions, which is out now has, I think about 25 people. Wow. Um, you know, so yeah, of course, if you're killing 25 people, it's kind of bloody. So, <laughs> you know, you, you kind of, you <clears throat> kind of got to expect that there's going to be a few people dying in, in that one, um, which is probably the one thing that uh, the, the critics have not liked as much about Asbaran is just that, you know, there's a lot of deaths, but it, it's necessary for the story that we're telling mm-hmm. um, between Mark and I. 
you know, it, it needed to be that way. And, and you'll eventually see, you know, readers of the series will see why it needed to be that way. Um, even if, even if it just looks like a bloodbath now, there's, there's a reason for it and, and they'll get to it. Um, but you know, it, it varies between, um, you know, five and, and 25 now, how many people are in each book. And, uh, yes, there have been a couple people that survived, um, there's, there's currently one person alive that I haven't killed. Uh, the other ones have then been killed in later books. Um, so we're, we're waiting to see if, um, uh, if Cindy is going to make it out alive. We'll see. Um, you know, the, the, the most interesting one. And, and generally when people say, Hey, I'd like to be a red shirt. I say, okay, well tell me something about yourself. Um, because you know, if it's going to be you, um, I, I try and stick in something where people can, you know, show their friends and, and relatives, hey, look, this is me. Um, you know, so I, I try and use a detail or two. For example, uh, I had the um, there was a, a technology person from a school district. And so I wrote him in as the, the tech guy and he did all of the tech solutions and figured out tech stuff, you know, and um, there was one guy that was a uh, military veteran and he had lost both his legs. So uh, in the book, he, he comes in as a cyborg. Um, you know, he's he's taken the cyborg transition and, you know, he traded in the, the beat up body for, you know, a metal body. And, and now he can go back and uh, kick E.T.'s butt. Um, so those, you know, I try and put in something. So I, I get this one uh, email and it says, hey, would you uh, would you take a black shirt? And I'm like, black shirt? Uh, and what's a black shirt? And he says, well, I'm a priest. And I said, oh, uh, and, and I'm kind of not in the business of killing priests. You know, that, right. that doesn't seem to be the best way to get to heaven. Um, so I was eh. and I thought about it a bit and I'm like, well, you know, Navy ships have chaplains, you know, and we're, we're spaceships, Navy. They they must have chaplains, too. So I wrote him back and I said, sure, I'll, I'll write you in as a chaplain. Absolutely. No problem. And he says, well, I'm not sure you want to do that. And I'm like. Well, then why did you come to the website and ask me to do it if you then say I don't want to do it? And, and he said, well, see, I've, I've got this blog and I'm, I'm kind of well known and, and you may not want to use me. And, and I thought, oh, you're well known. Hey, that's going to be even better. Marketing, marketing. Yay. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, and I was like, oh, well, you know, well, that's OK. You know, hey, no worries. We oh, I'll put you in. Uh, it turns out he is the blogger for the Pope. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he was writing a blog for the Pope about what does the prayer say? And I was like, oh, my gosh. Um, you know, and it was one of the, the bigger blogs in Christendom. And I, oh, you're definitely in. Oh, yeah, you right. are so in. <laughs> um, and, and then uh, I couldn't kill him off in the first book because he talked about it on his blog. You know, so I, I had to had to keep him in for another book. Um, but then he died. You know, right. ah, too bad. Um, and, and as soon as he died, though, he was like, hey, um, so could you bring me back, you know, like as a is a Doctor Who Time Lord or something like that? And I was like, oh, come on, father. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but then I figured out a way to bring him back, so I did. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty cool. I think so, that's, so. He's I've actually killed him a couple times now. That's funny. I think that's such a cool idea that that you do with your fans. That's, that's definitely something unique, and hopefully more authors would do that because I, I think that's pretty cool, a fun way to and engage you, your fans. Usually, um, where I can, the 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 people that do that. Um, end up going out with a bang, um, you know, doing something for the the good of the unit or the uh, the good of the the humankind. You know, they they do something you know that um, is going to get them one of those you know medal of honor kind of situations uh, where they're sacrificing themselves for the good of everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, not always, you know, sometimes, you know, war, war happens and somebody's got to take that random bullet. Um, but, but usually they get a pretty good death out of it too. And, and, you know, that gives them something that, you know, they can feel good about, Hey, I, I may have died, but, but look, I saved, you know, whatever. That's right. Went out guns blazing. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that is awesome. Well, here at the, uh, legendary, and we like to end each podcast episode with a segment that we call the legendary ending. So these are going to be 
books. Some of them are kind of book related, but some of them aren't uh, questions. Uh, the first one is what songs are currently on your writing playlist? I listen to Two Steps from Hell. Um, it, it's all epic music, you know, uh, no words, but, you know, it, it's the the music that you hear in movies when epic things are happening. Um, it, it really is neat for writing uh, combat, especially, um, you know, I don't I don't know all the names of the songs, but I I have like a four hour reel on YouTube. So uh, <laughs> there's probably I, I couldn't tell you how many, but a whole pile. Wow, that's that's pretty awesome. I'll have to look that up. I've never heard of that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I know a lot of people that that listen to that, um, that that are writers, especially military sci-fi, because it is it is just it, it really gets you going. It gets the blood pumping. It uh, gets you in the right the right mood to to write some battles. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, so the next question is, if you were stuck in a zombie apocalypse, which one of your book characters would you want to be stuck with and why? I would want uh, I would want the seal master chief uh, from the, the first cup, first series of books, uh, Ryan O'Leary, to be with me because he's he's a bad guy <laughs> um, and, and he has all sorts of all sorts of skills. And if somebody or something needs needs uh, getting killed, he's the right man to do it. And that works. He's, uh, he's probably he's probably going to kill all the zombies all by himself. I won't even have to. I can just stand around and watch. Sit back and relax. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Master if, Chief, go get him. That's right. <laughs> if you were in a zombie apocalypse with any character from any media source, books, movies, comics, whatever, who would you want to be stuck with and why? Chuck Norris. Because uh, Chuck Norris. Because Chuck Norris. <laughs> that's all that needs to be said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'm definitely getting out then. That's right. Um, if you had a time machine, where would you travel and why? Oh, where would I travel? Um, well, oh, the, I, I know what I'd do. It's going to sound tremendously lame. Uh, of, of all the wonderful things I could go back and do and the people I could meet and, and all of this. I, I'd be awfully tempted not to go back like uh, five years and, and bet on all of the sports events that I know because I have three kids in college right now and I really need the money. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. Having having just gotten the bills again, you know, three kids in college, it's like, oh, dear God, uh, can I go back and play the lottery That's if right. I know the name, if I know the numbers? <laughs> That's funny. Um, it's, it's sad. Yeah. Um, it's lame, but yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> If you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? Oh, one superpower. I'd like to fly. Yeah? I, I get I get awfully tired of driving. Uh, I do a lot of driving. It'd be awfully fun to be able to fly. Um, and of course, it'd, it'd be hard to carry books, but I could have them shipped. Um, I'd want to fly. It would just be too cool. I miss flying. Uh, I flew for the Navy. Um, you know, I've got about 3,000 hours uh, of flight time, um, and, and I I really miss it at times, and, and it'd be great to be able, you know, beautiful day like today uh, here is in Virginia Beach. I'd, I'd love to go fly. Yeah. Do you do you have a favorite uh, plane that you flew that, that, that you would love to get back uh, in the pilot seat and fly again? I, I actually am not a pilot. I'm a naval flight officer, which um, in um, in in the plane that I flew, which was the A6 uh, Intruder, it was a, a bomber off of the carrier. It was uh, side by side, two two people, uh, pilot on the left, uh, bombardier navigator on the right. I was the bombardier, okay. um, and you know the pilot does the stick and throttle kind of thing, and and I had the communications, navigation, and weapon system. Uh, basically, I had all the cool toys. I had the laser and the FLIR and, you know, and, um, oh, I'd love to go. I'd love to go do that again. Uh, too bad there aren't any more. Right. Yeah. <laughs> They've all been retired and a lot of them are uh, coral reefs and bombing targets on ranges. You know, that's the ultimate irony is that the bomber is now being bombed. That's right. Uh, um, so the question that we're kind of famous for around here is a penguin walks through that door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say and why is he here? He says, Senor, I brought the cerveza for the football game tomorrow. The, 
the the Super Bowl. I brought the cerveza for it. There we go. And, and he says that because the birds are in the Super Bowl. My Atlanta Falcons are there, and you know it's time to cheer for the birds. So we're we're going to be pulling for the Atlanta Falcons while we're drinking the cerveza. I think a lot of people will be rooting for the uh, Atlanta Falcons tomorrow in the Super Bowl. I not, know. not only the Atlanta lovers, but also the Patriot haters. That's right. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> there you go. My team's. Not I don't. I don't care how you come while. to the Falcons. I'll take it. That's right. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and then before we leave, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with the listeners? Yeah. Um, if you are an author, um, the, the thing that I see people do wrong most often is that they spend all their time working on their book and they get, you know, they edit it. They get a great cover. Uh, they get it, you know, right to the end. They publish it. And nothing happens. Nobody knows about it. Nobody finds it. And and they say, oh, I'm a failure. Uh, I guess it wasn't a very good book. Well, the, the problem isn't with the book. The problem is that the marketing process needs to start four to six months prior to a book coming out so that when the book comes out, um, people are ready for it. People like to do business with people they know, like, and trust. If you're a first-time author, nobody knows you. Nobody knows if they like you, and, and nobody knows if they can trust you. They don't know if you're going to have a good book, if it's going to be well edited. So, you know, they they there's no reason for people to pick it up. Um, so you need to do that marketing thing ahead of time. Um, you know, where you you start talking about it, and and that way, when you know the book comes out, you've developed a platform. You have some social media. What whatever, um, you can say, hey, you know, I've been talking about this book for a couple months. Um, it's out. I'd really appreciate it if you'd go take a look. Um, will everybody go do that? No, of course not. But some will. And, and you say, hey, you know, and if you like it, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if you'd write a review. Um, and, and definitely all the people aren't going to do that. Reviews are <laughs> incredibly hard to get. Yeah. Um, but but some will because you will have developed this um, a relationship with people. And, and you, that way you get the initial sales and you get some of the reviews and, you know, hopefully you get enough that it it, it gets into Amazon's algorithm where Amazon starts uh, marketing for you as well. And, and you know, you'll you'll make some sales and, and do well. Um, so the, the biggest point that I would say is, um, you know, it's it's not uh, necessarily about the book these days. It's about the the advertising and the word of mouth and things like that. Um, I mean, dear God, Twilight and, and Fifty Shades of Grey are horrifically written books, um, but they've made, you know, bazillions of dollars. Um, so, you know, you may have the best book in the world, but if it doesn't sell, that doesn't mean that it's a bad book. It means that it's a, a marketing failure. Well, um, where can our listeners go if they'd like to learn more about you or your books? Uh, they can come to the website, uh, chriskennedypublishing.com. Uh, they can also find me um, on Facebook, uh, chriskennedypublishing.biz. And I uh, am on Twitter as Chris Kennedy, at Chris Kennedy 110. Um, every morning I, I put out uh, several tweets either on uh, writing, uh, becoming a better writer, becoming a better marketer, or uh, a better authorpreneur, um, you know, and then there'll be the obligatory uh, tweet about a book or something. Um, but but at least, um, you know, I'll get at least several of those out. Sometimes, uh, depending on the, the time I have, I'll, I'll have a few, you know, I'll, I'll do it later in the day as well. But uh, at least once in the morning, uh, if you want to uh, keep building your skills, you know, that's one way to get some good stuff. Okay. Well, we'll put links to all those uh, in the show notes over at legendarium.com. Thank awesome. you. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Thank you for coming on and doing 30 minute author interviews. We appreciate it. You bet. Hey, thanks a lot for having me, Preston. It's yeah. been great. Yeah. Well, everybody, that's all the time we've got for this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to 30 minute author interviews. We hope you come back and join us next Wednesday and every Wednesday for a brand new episode. And head on over to Legendarium.com and check out the show notes for this episode. There you'll find the links to the two sponsors that we have, Serial Box and Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul Hicks. These are both things that I enjoy and I believe that you will enjoy them as well. So head on over to the show notes, check them out, and let them know that you heard about them through the Legendarium and 30-Minute Author Interviews. I would also like to thank two of our Patreon supporters. I would like to thank... 
third scribe and Maggie Stewart Grant. They're supporting 30 minute author interviews on Patreon. You can support 30 minute author interviews for as little as $1 a month. And at $5 a month, you get the bonus podcast called 10 Questions With that comes out every week on Tuesday. We also have a Patreon only t shirt and one of a kind uh, sketch from Ben Adams as well. So head on over to patreon.com slash legendarium and check out the different rewards. And until next time, guys, have a good one. And remember to always stay legendary. Last week, they just... uh, Dang it.